Okay, welcome everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for coming to our first Women's Leadership Lecture Series for fall semester. We're really excited about this. Our next one is on November 15th, so same time Thursday at 11 a.m. Keep that in your calendars. We're really glad you're able to make it. Hopefully everyone was able to get food. Afterwards, if there's more, please grab more. Um, we're gonna start off with an opening prayer by Kyrie, um, our marketing coordinator, and then I'm gonna go ahead and read Dr. Wheeler's biography, and then we'll introduce her. So, Kyrie. Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful for this beautiful day, and we're grateful for um, the opportunity that we have to be here at Women's Leadership Lecture, and we're grateful for um, Dr. Wheeler and for the message that she's prepared for us today. Please help us uh, as we um, listen to her message that we can apply it to our lives and that we can gain more confidence in ourselves and um, remember our worth, and we're so grateful for the Heavenly Father, and um, we're grateful for the people that have taken the time to uh, make this lecture series happen, and we we love you so very much, Heavenly Father, and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Um, so I will just give a little short introduction here. Dr. Louise Wheeler is an assistant clinical professor and psychologist here at Brigham Young University. She has a PhD in clinical psychology also from BYU. Her educational areas of special interest include chronic mental illness, couples therapy, depression, eating disorders, trauma, women's issues, multicultural issues, and the experience of people of color. We're really excited to have her here, so please give a round of welcome and applause. <laughs> Can you hear me fine without this? Yes, okay. Um, and now that we can hear you. Oh, you can't hear me? Okay, I'll do that. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, and I'll walk around a little bit to uh, change slides and stuff, so I hope I'm not making it difficult for people who are recording. Um, but okay, so I. I'm grateful uh, for Women's Services. Uh, they asked me to uh, do a presentation earlier this year, and it was um, a really cool opportunity to kind of reflect on my own journey. And so I'm glad that um, I get to talk about confidence a little bit today. So I, uh, I'm going to talk about specifically confidence in the context of like education and um, and work uh, for women. Um, so something I realized when I decided to go to grad school was that um, I was really excited, my parents were really excited, and then other people were kind of like, why? Um, so not as excited as I was. Um, and so I, uh, I grew up in a family where education was really valued. My parents pushed a lot for me and my siblings to go to college and get an education and uh, they didn't have like specific goals for us education wise, they just wanted us to study something that we valued and that would be useful for us. And so like I said, they were really excited when I, uh, when I went, when I was accepted in my PhD program um, and uh, even like my, my grandma, she was so excited that she called people I had never met before on her <laughs> little island in Africa to tell them that her granddaughter was going to be a doctor, which no, I'm not a physician, so if you have a heart attack, don't talk to me, but uh, if, you have, if you're in emotional distress, that's the kind of doctor I am. Um, but when, so education was something really precious for my family and something that we really valued. Um, and then when I, uh, when I moved to Utah, so I'm from France originally, that's where I was born and grew up. I did my undergrad in France and then I came here for grad school um, about seven, eight years ago. And, uh, and when I came here, I was really surprised by what people would uh, say to me about going to grad school. So I have two stories about this that really made me realize that I was really excited about my education, but because of my gender and my race, people were not as on board with what I was doing. So the first story was my first uh, semester of grad school. Um, I was 
get, getting ready to take my first final, uh, and it was in our psychopathology class, uh, which um, that was kind of an intense class, a lot of material to like memorize, and and so, and if you if you speak a different language, school is kind of hard when it's not your first language, especially when it's like technical terms. So I was really um, nervous and really set on doing well to kind of prove people that I was like where I was supposed to be. So I studied really hard the night before, and then I did something that I rarely do, which is I got up really early uh, so I could study more. Um, and if you know me, you know that's quite a struggle for me. So I got up early, and I like at 5, and I studied, and then I was like, okay, it's 6 o'clock, I'm just going to walk to campus. Uh, and study more on campus. And so it was December, and it had snowed, and it was really cold. So I left, uh, and it was dark, and then it was icy, and so <laughs> I fell and broke my hand on my way to my first final, um, which is kind of a sad story, but also it's kind of funny uh, <laughs> now that it's over. So anyways, I got up, and I kind of panicked, so I called my mom, who's still in France. So she was like, I don't know what you want me to do. I go to the doctor. So I went to the student health center to their urgent care services. And I walked in and I was trying really hard not to cry. Like I was like, I can do this. Um, but I was in a lot of pain. So I told them, I think I broke my hand. So they said, OK, let's like, like we'll have you get an um, x-ray. So um, I meet with the whatever they're called, people that give you x-rays. Um, and uh, the person started ask, asking me questions. So he, he asked me um, what I was studying, and I said psychology. And he said, oh, you can't really do anything with that unless you go to grad school. Um, and then he didn't know I was in grad school. Um, and so then he asked me if I was married. And I was 21, I wasn't married. Like I had barely met my future husband. But um, I, I told him, no, I'm not married. And he said, well, what are you doing then? Like I said, oh, I'm in grad school. And he said, oh, you're in grad school. That's why you're not married. You're too smart. Um, you're too smart, you're not going to get married. Um, and, and that was the first time someone explicitly said that to me. And then I heard it several more times throughout my graduate education that because I was in grad school, maybe I was a little bit of a threat for men, so no one would want to marry Which I was like, OK, like that's kind of something to think about. But also, it didn't make me want to stop going to grad school. Um, and the second story was that in my graduate pro program, there was someone that was some so, um, said something to me once that really bothered me. And it's one of those things that if I could go back and say something, I would do it. Uh, but he offered to give me a ride home after class, and so it was our second semester of grad school, and so we got to my like my apartment complex, and he said, I just wanted to tell you, Louise, that you, last semester, I, I kind of thought, if someone's going to not make it, it's going to be Louise. <laughs> and you really surprised me. Like, because I made it to one semester, like, what an accomplishment. But he was, like, telling me that he didn't expect me to be successful. And so I, I was, like, feeling really awkward. Imagine yourself being in a situation where you're in a car with someone and they say something like that, and you're like, okay, I'm just going to go now. And I didn't know what to say. Now I know what I would say if I was in this situation again. But from these two stories, there's two messages that... Um, really kind of stuck with me for a long time that where maybe I don't belong here. I felt like it made me doubt myself. Not that I doubted my ability to be successful in graduate school, but my, it made me doubt that this was an environment where people wanted me to be. And so um, I, I felt kind of alone and isolated. I had a hard time kind of finding my place for a while. Uh, and this kind of guided, if you if you end up going to grad school and becoming a professor, like you'll see that a lot of the research that you do is guided by your experience. At least it's the case for a lot of people in my life. And it's, it's uh, the case for me where a lot of the research that I do is on race and on gender, and it's guided by, by my experience. Um, but um, so I, uh, I felt like 
I kind of started questioning myself and I felt like I stood out, but not in a positive way. I stood out on campus because I was a white student and because I was an international student uh, and there were not very many of us. Um, I uh, stood out at church because I was pursuing a higher education and uh, like I often like laugh about something that happened after I got married. Someone in my ward asked me, okay, what are you going to do now? And I was still in grad school, so I said, what do you mean I'm going to like? And she said, well, are you like going to keep going to school? And the fact that some people expected me to stop going to school because I was now married, I had never thought about that. So it was quite interesting. Uh, I stayed in school, just so you know. And so <laughs> should you. Um, but um, yeah, I felt kind of a stood out in my classes for being a little more outspoken than other of my classmates. Um, and um, and so all, I felt like all those uh, messages, whether they were explicit or implicit, made me kind of, again, feel like I didn't belong where I was. Um, and so when I reflect through my, uh, on my journey through grad school and as a young professional, I, um, there's a lot of feelings that come up for me. So there's like a lot of pride for what I have done. Because grad school is not easy. Um, and I was meeting with one of my friends from grad school earlier this week, and she said, I don't think I would do it again. I think I would. I would do it again in a heartbeat, even if it really sucked. Um, it was like so worth it. Uh, but, and I feel a lot of joy for what I have accomplished and what I'm doing now. I feel like the best uh, kind of like slap back to the people that were kind of doubtful about what I could do is that I, I can live my life to the fullest. So sometimes I want to go back to the student health center and see if that person still works there and show them this picture. Um, so I got married. Hey, um, and not that my life would be horrible if I didn't get married. I just want to be that clear. But I, I'm glad that I found a partner that was not like, OK, maybe you should drop out of grad school. So our relationship works. And I'll say more about that in a minute. But I got married and I made it. I graduated. Um, uh, and I got to celebrate my graduation with my parents and with my youngest brother. And so I made it and I feel really proud of that. But uh, I also feel, when I look back at my journey, I also feel a little bit of sadness um, for all the times when I internalized those messages and I doubted myself. Um, and I feel like the way I tried to compensate for that was to work harder to prove that I was there and that I deserved to be there. Uh, and I think that sometimes I still do that in a way. But what I know is that the harder I worked, um, not because I wanted to work hard, but because I wanted to show everyone that it was okay for me to be where I was, the unhappier I was and the less confident I felt, because it felt like every step was a reminder of ina how inadequate I was actually feeling. And so I think that <coughs> sometimes, often, not sometimes, most of the time, um, I think that we don't prepare our female students for this world where people um, <coughs> will make them feel less confident. And we don't prepare them not to internalize those messages, especially in our current culture and, and in Utah especially, we, we talk about womanhood as something that needs to fit a specific ideal, right? Like you have to look a specific way, uh, you have to um, be uh, a specific type of personality, usually that involves being nurturing, uh, whatever that means. I still have a hard time defining that concept for myself. You can't be too emotional. Uh, you can't um, uh, want, uh, you can't be too outspoken. You can't be too ambitious when then you're a threat, like the story I was telling you earlier. Um, and so I feel like this can cause some, some of us, and at least for me, caused me to doubt myself more than I should have. Um, and so, I'm glad that I'm in a point of life where I don't feel like I have to prove everyone wrong anymore. Um, and I hope all of you get to that point. Um, but um, I, I, I want to talk about a few things that I wish had been taught to me more explicitly in school about being confident um, and about finding your own uh, 
journey. And so the first thing uh, that I want to talk about is actually, I don't know, um, I'm actually going to skip this. Um, I don't know a lot of people that are born confident. Like I know a lot of people that have built confidence, but I don't know a lot of people that like from age zero, I guess, when you're born, uh, who are like, I can do this, right? Life is hard and it takes a lot of trial and error to figure out um, how to be confident. I was reading a study recently about this and um, I put this on the slide, um, but um, about how confidence is built through the things that you know, the things that you learn, but also your experiences, right? Like the feedback that people will give you or not give you, and also the way you perceive yourself and your ability to do things. Um, and your ability to trust yourself. And I hope that a few of the things that I'll talk about today will kind of help you um, figure out how to make that work for yourself. Um, something that, going back to that story at the health center, um, something that I have, I haven't had to deal as much, but a lot of my friends have. Um, and I've reflected, and a lot of the students I work with here have dealt with some experiences around that as well, but feeling that people will like you more if you change something about yourself. So maybe if you're a little more quiet, or um, maybe if you're a little more, um, if you desire things that are more in line with what they desire, um, that people will accept you more and like you more. And something that I've really, my parents have always been really good actually at teaching me that if someone wants me to change something about myself, that's something that is like that is not something that I do wrong, but just something they don't like. They don't deserve to have me in their life and they don't deserve to have my attention and my time and like things like that, right? But um, I remember when I was uh, early uh, in grad school and people would, uh, I, I remember going on a date once with someone that was really surprised I was in grad school, first of all. Like, he'd never met a woman that was in grad school, which I don't believe, but uh, he wasn't looking hard enough, is what I'm saying. Uh, and then he, it bothered him that I wanted to work, not only that I was in grad school, but that also it had always been clear for me that after grad school, I would work, no matter what happened. And of course, I, I want to be open to the possibility of life changing my life, my, my mind. But I was clear that this was something that I wanted to, to do. And it pushed a lot of people away, um, which is sad, but also it filtered people for me. So it worked out. Uh, but I remember early on when I was uh, dating my husband, um, and we were really young, but we're not that old, but like we were really young. Look at us. Uh, and uh, I remembered thinking, okay, I want to talk about this with him, but I, I wasn't sure how to talk about it. And he's actually the one that brought it up one day. And I don't know if he even remembers, but we were hanging out um, at the house where I lived at the time. And he said, uh, we were kind of like starting to talk about getting married. And uh, we talked about kind of, the life we pictured for ourselves in the future. And he said, I don't think you should stop working ever. And I had never mentioned that. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> what do you mean? And he said, like you invested a lot in your education and you actually are passionate about what you're doing. I feel like it would be a waste for you to stop working, if, especially if you don't want to stop working, right? He was really open. Uh, and that was like a turning point for me where I realized, okay, there's people out there that are cheering for us, uh, us that are ambitious, us that have clear goals and are set on what we want to do. Um, there are people out there that are cheering for us. And that was really important for me um, to realize. Another thing that I learned so I actually, this feels like a very vulnerable picture for me to show, but I feel like it's important. So this is me <laughs> uh, at the end of my first year of grad school. Um, so my first year of grad school was really hard uh, because grad school is hard. I missed my family. I, um, and there was stuff going on outside of school that were a little hard, but I actually got, I got an ulcer at the end of my first year of grad school. 
Um, and again, that was a turning point, a really painful turning point that I hope you don't have to get there to realize this. But um, we had this little office for grad students where we would meet and like read papers and do research and stuff. And so this is me in that office feeling exhausted. Um, and one of my friends took a picture of it, of course. Uh, <laughs> turned out to be useful, but um, <laughs> that, that was a moment where I remember having to have my roommate take me to the ER because I was in so much pain. And, and I called my mom, and I always call my mom because <coughs> she can't really do anything because she's so far away, but I like calling her, like talking to her when I'm struggling. And she started crying, actually, which I was like, why are you crying? Like, I'm not dying, I just have an ulcer. And she was like, no, like you, she said you, this is too much, like you can't do this to yourself. And I realized that she was right, like I didn't have, I was fine, if I made it to grad school, it meant, it meant that I was fine. I didn't have to like literally hurt my body to prove everyone that I deserved to be there. Uh, and from there, like it, it started like a long journey of like learning how to take care of myself and learning how to say no and learning how to not take on things that I didn't need to take on. And I still struggle with that, but it was a turning point of me realizing that um, I didn't have to work to exhaust myself to feel confident. I was trying to compensate for all these insecurities I had by working so hard but I already deserved to be there because they accepted me in the program, right? And so that was a sh big shift for me. And and I, again, I hope that it doesn't take you having to be driven to the ER by your friend um, and then your friend taking a picture of you in pain in this little office. That doesn't even exist anymore, which is kind of sad. Um, but, uh, but that you can realize that you can that you are smart enough, you are competent enough if you are here, and if you are doing the things that you're doing, and that it, what matters more now is to focus on what you're passionate about, to focus on what's driving you and what you want to do rather than focusing on how to show everyone else that, they, that you deserve to be here because you do more than them. Um, so, so don't be me in that situation. Um, another thing that I learned um, so I didn't have, uh, the program I graduated from didn't have any female faculty at the time, which is kind of unusual in psychology because it's a female dominated field. Um, but I found myself kind of craving female mentorship and role models as I was going through grad school. And so I found I'm kind of, um, I really like reading, and so I found a lot of comfort in reading books and learning about authors that accomplished things that I felt like I connected to. For example, Maya Angelou is like my hero. Like sometimes in the church we talk about meeting people in the afterlife, and she's the first person I want to be. Like I don't want to hurt Jesus's feelings, but like if I can get there and Maya Angelou's there, that will be like. I will be so happy. Uh, but So she's one of them. And then another one that I learned more about uh, was uh, Audrey Lord. I don't know if anyone is familiar with her. Um, she's an African-American um, feminist writer. Um, and she wrote this essay after she was uh, diagnosed with uh, cancer um, that really helped me contemplate the way I was approaching life. And I'll, I'll read a quote from it in a minute. but. I felt at some points in my life where I grew up in a family where I was encouraged to speak my mind. Um, and sometimes I had to be called out by my parents on speaking my mind too much. Um, and I was helpful, but I was my voice was valued in the environment where I grew up. And I noticed that when I came to BYU, I slowly started to disengage from hard conversations. I started to not speak up my mind as much anymore because people didn't react super well to my opinions and I felt like it was pushing a lot of people away from me. And that was really hard for me. And so I felt like, okay, I need to find a balance where I'm not being um, unfaithful to myself, right? Like to who I am, uh, but also I can not push people away. Now I'm in a different spot where I'm like, well, if people don't want to be in my life, that's okay. Maybe that's not the health. 
But anyways, uh, Audrey Lord wrote, wrote this essay where she talks, she says, um, I'll just read what she talks about. So she says, in becoming forcibly and essentially aware of my mortality, and that's after she was diagnosed with, uh, or she had to wait for a diagnosis about whether tumor was cancer or not. She says, and of what I wished and wanted for my life, however short it might be, priorities and omissions became strongly etched in a merciless light, and what I most regretted were my silences. Of what I of what had I ever been afraid? To question or to speak as I believed could have meant pain or death. But we all hurt in so many different ways all the time, and pain will either change or end. Death, on the other hand, is the final silence. And that might be coming quickly now without regard for whether I had ever spoken what needed to be said or had only betrayed myself into small silences while I plan planned someday to speak or waited for someone else's words. And I began to recognize a source of power within myself that comes from the knowledge that while it is mo most desirable not to be afraid, learning to put fear into perspective get me, gave me great strength. She goes on as saying, my silences had not protected me. Your silence will not protect you. We can learn to work and speak when we are afraid in the same way we have learned to work and speak when we are tired. For we have been socialized to respect fear more than our own needs for language and definition. And while we wait in silence for that final luxury of fearlessness, the weight of that silence will choke us. Um, so I remember reading that and being like, oh my gosh, like, my silence about things that matter to me is not making those things go away. Um, the, the things that I'm passionate about, um, I'm really passionate about social justice. If I don't speak up about it, it's not, no one is fixing it, fixing my situation for me in those moments. Of course I have allies, of course I have friends, of course I have family, but um, I loved when she said that she felt like she was betraying herself by being silent. Like there are things that only you have the power to speak to. Um, and I think part of being confident is being authentic to yourself and what you believe in. You can't become confident in being someone that you're not. What, by trying to be someone that you're not or by, by trying to be something that doesn't work out for you. Um, and so that's something I worked on a lot and it's hard. It's hard to speak up. Uh, it's hard to uh, and even now where I have maybe a tiny, tiny bit more power, like when I teach a class, there are things that are hard to, to say to my students, right? But um, my silence does not protect me. And the more I speak up about things that matter to me, the more I speak up about my experience, the more I speak up about things that I, I believe are not right, the more confident I feel to continue speaking up and being myself. Um, so it's a really powerful essay. Um, if you want to read it, I would highly recommend it. Um, another thing that I was thinking about I was, as I was preparing for this, comp uh, as whatever this is, <laughs> lecture, uh, I, uh, I, I realized that for a long time in my life, I confused conf confidence with pride. I thought, okay, if I, if I'm like proud of what I've done, it means that I'm prideful. But there's a difference between being prideful and feeling proud for something you've accomplished. Um, and like I remember one specific experience when I was growing up where uh, I, I was one of a few people in my ward that could play the piano. So of course, I had that calling for like 90% of my life. Um, and uh, to the point where when I first got married, I didn't tell anyone that I had the piano. Then I can't remember how someone found out, and I got the calling again. But anyways, um, I, I remember like complaining to my mom about how I felt uncomfortable about having to play the piano in front of everyone, blah, blah, blah. And my mom said, what? Like, stop complaining about that. Like, this is, you're, this is something you're good at. Just do it. And I thought, I, whoa. Like I, I felt uncomfortable with that, but now, now that I like, like look back at 
the things that have happened in my life from grad school to now, like I feel really proud of what I have done and I don't walk around boasting about it, right? So that, that's where the difference is, like be proud of what you're doing. Uh, be proud of um, the hard things that you're doing and the happy things that you're doing and sometimes be just proud of yourself for getting out of bed in the morning. There are days when that's really hard uh, to do. Um, and so I think another way that I've been able to build confidence in my life and I wish someone had taught me more skills about this earlier is to acknowledge the things that I have done because they remind me that I can do hard things and that I can push through uh, painful situations and I can feel joy and be happy about the things that I have accomplished. Um, so that's another thing that's really important to me. Um, Okay, this one is in Latin, so I, I, I was listening to another person that I really like is Oprah. <laughs> I just love Oprah. Anyways, uh, Oprah and Maya Angelou had a really close relationship, so that's why I love Oprah. Because if Maya Angelou liked her, I can. Like um, but anyways, she uh, she had an interview with Maya Angelou a few years before she passed away, and uh, she uh, Maya Angelou quoted. This, uh, this is from like a, a Roman play. Um, anyways, this means um, I am human uh, and nothing human can be alien to me. Um, and this is something I've wrestled with a lot in the past few years. Um, and it goes along with another one that I want to talk about here, um, which is having more compassion for yourself. So. What I hear when I hear Maya Angelou talks about talking about uh, nothing human can be alien to me is accepting that I'm imperfect and that I'm going to struggle and that I'm going to make mistakes and that that's part of my experience and that it's okay uh, that I don't have to that I can have compassion for myself in those situations where I do something that I think is annoying or I make a mistake or. I, don't, I do something and think it's not good enough, so I beat myself up about it. Um, I think this is a piece that was introduced in my life by a supervisor a couple of years ago, and I've been really like wrestling with that idea of being accepting of my imperfections, uh, and understanding that the imperfect being that I am right now is the way that I was created, and it's okay for me to be imperfect. Um, and. And so this is something that I think help, helps me build confidence is like spending more time um, focusing on uh, being kind to myself. Um, like one thing that I have three brothers that I love very, very much. And I often think about my youngest brother. Um, he's 10 years younger than me. Um, and, and he's at that stage of life where things are kind of awkward because you're almost done with high school and you don't really know what you want to do next and anyways I sometimes ask myself if Zach was in my situation what would I tell him because I'm really good at being kind to my siblings and having the right words for my brothers but um, if I can use a little bit of that language for myself too it gets me going a long way um, when I was a teenager and I was kind of a nerd, and as I'm saying that, I know my husband is sitting in the room and he's probably thinking you're still a nerd. So I will reframe this, that I am still a nerd. I am kind of a nerd. Anyways, when I was in high school, uh, middle school and high school, I was really into Harry Potter. And uh, I read the books a million times. Um, and I really connected with the story, like, just like this was my generation thing. If you're I've noticed recently that a lot of people younger than me are like not into Harry Potter, and that's okay. But, um, anyways, there's this sentence in uh, so in Harry Potter and the Cursed Child that came out last two years ago. It's it's not that good, don't read it. But there's this one sentence in it that's really cool, um, where Dumbledore tells Harry, "Harry, there is never a perfect answer in this messy, emotional world." Perfection is beyond the reach of humankind, beyond the reach of magic. In every shining moment of happiness is that drop of poison, the knowledge that pain will come again. 
Be honest to those you love, show your pain. To suffer is as human as to breathe. And that's part of, I think that's part of having compassion for yourself, is to remembering that your struggles in life are part of being human and, um, and that you do have the ability to work through those and to get back on your feet. Uh, if you can remember that, that class that's a little harder feels a little less threatening. That assignment that's a little overwhelming feels a little less uh, threatening. If you put things in a perspective, like Audrey Lord said, um, you can, and you look at your situation with more kindness, you can take a step uh, towards um, compassion for yourself and by that build more confidence in yourself. Um, okay, I, another one that um, I've been reflecting on a lot lately is there is not one right way to be. Um, so like I said, when I first got married, there were people that asked me if I was going to stop going to grad school, uh, which I didn't. And then uh, after a few years, my husband and I have been married for a little over three years, and people, it's really interesting because when you get married, people feel like they can ask you questions that are just like, I don't know, I would never ask people. Anyways, people have asked, why don't you have children? Like literally, why don't you have children? Not when are you going to have children? Uh, which is the reason why you're doing what you're doing is really no one's business, which is part of confidence too. Like being set enough and comfortable enough in what you're doing is part of confidence. But um, again, those messages that we internalize about what we're supposed to be or what we should be doing those get in our way, right? And I, uh, I've been reading a lot about, um, I don't know if any of you are familiar, if you've taken my class, you, you'll have heard about her a million times, but Sister Okazaki, who was uh, the first woman of color to serve on a general board for the church, and then was in the General Relief Society presidency in the early, like late 80s, early 90s, I think. Um, I think she was way at, like ahead of her time. I don't know if the 90s, were like ready for her. Uh, but I'm so glad she was where she was because we can be still benefit from what she talked about. A little bit about her. So she was Japanese American, uh, grew up in Hawaii, and she's very open about uh, the racism she experienced in the church, both in Hawaii and then when she moved to Utah. Uh, she married someone who was a non-member. He later converted to the church, but at first he was a non-member. Uh, she had two children, and then she worked for most of her life. She was a school teacher, and I think she was a principal, too, later on. Uh, but she wrote several books, but my favorite one by her is Lighten Up. And uh, she talks about, she has this quote that I love where she says, there's not just one right way to be a Mormon woman. And that's something I've like really re been reflecting on. Um, there's not just one right way to be, I know we're not supposed to say Mormon anymore. <laughs> Disclaimer, this is from 1990 something. Um, but uh, there's not just one right way to be a woman in the church. Um, what you bring to the church that is you and that no one else can bring is, I think, as I believe, as welcomed by God as anything else. Whether you are married, whether you have children, whether you have you went to grad school whether you didn't like I don't I I I really believe that like I tell this to my students all the time revelation is personal what you do is between you and God and whether the culture we're evolving in here understands it or not it's still between you and God um, and that's a way for me to get set in like, or feel confident in the things that I'm doing is that they feel right to me. And they don't have to feel right for anyone else. I don't have to uh, convince everyone at church that it's okay for me to not have children and to not have children because I didn't want children while I was in grad school and while I was getting set in my career. It was like a conscious choice for me. And so um, it, remember that, like get, get that like somewhere 
like on your mirror or something. I, I think about this so often at church, like there's not one right way to be a Mormon woman. Uh, there's your way to be a Mormon woman, and that works. Um, so remember that. Um, the last one, um, this is one that I've been reflected on, reflecting on a lot lately, and that I wasn't sure if I was going to include in this presentation or not, but I think it's an important way. Like in my journey to be authentic, this is one that's important for me to talk about. Um, I recently started thinking about, um, so I went home for the summer and I had a blast. It was great because France is great. They have good, they have good food. Um, it's great. Just If you go, just go for the cheese. It's good. Um, but anyways, I, I hadn't been home for three years and um, I, uh, I, I was surprised when I got back to Utah. I stayed in France for two months. I was uh, surprised like how hard it was for me to come back. Um, and I'm not unhappy here most of the time. I'm just kidding. Uh, overall, I'm really happy here. Like I love the life that I have with my family here. I, I, I love the work that I do. Like I'm happy. But when I got back, I felt this like weight uh, well, first I missed my family, like I, like I really missed them, and then I, um, I missed my home. Uh, I missed the maybe a little bit of the political stability there is in France that maybe we don't have here right now because there's a lot going on. Um, I, I like I missed feeling like when I go to France, I feel like oh, I belong here. Um, I can speak my mind and people just join me there because French people are, they don't like beat around the bush. They're like a little more to the point. But anyways, I, so I, I, I read my scriptures a little more after coming back um, to find a little bit of comfort. And I read, um, and now I'm blanking on, <laughs> this is so embarrassing, but I'm confident I can go through this. Um, <laughs> Jacob where the parable of the, uh, I was going to say the graveyard, not the graveyard, <laughs> <laughs> um, where the master, the lord of the uh, vineyard and um, his servant go back and forth about what to do. Uh, this is how well I know my scriptures, about what to do about something, like something growing that wasn't supposed to grow. Um, <laughs> and then there's, uh, this is why I don't teach religion. Uh, and then there's this passage where um, the, the Lord a couple times asks his servant, well, I don't know, what do you think we should do? And I had this moment of like, why does, like, he's the Lord of the vineyard. He knows what he's talking about. Um, and I started reflecting on, I like rely, my spirituality and my relationship with the divine is like, a really important piece of my identity and I rely on it a lot uh, and often I think about the scripture where okay if Christ got, get, has my back I can do this but I never think about the fact that like sometimes I know what to do and sometimes like I picture Christ hearing me complain about something and maybe he rolls his eyes because he knows I know what to do right <laughs> He trusts me, just like the Lord of the vineyard trusted his servant and asked him for his input. Like he trusts me to be an expert into my own experience and knowing what is right for me or not. He'll have my back always and he'll, when I ask, he'll, not all the time, but a lot of times we'll, I'll feel peace and I'll feel like, okay, I can do this because I feel right about it, but I think there's this piece of him also cheering us on because he trusts that we know what we can do too. What we're able, like he knows we have the skills, uh, the brain. I often tell uh, people I work with in therapy, like, well, like God give you a brain, like so you can use it. No, so you not so you just rely on everyone else to make hard decisions for you, right? Like, this is a piece of us that I think is important to connect with. Just like if you're a parent, I'm not a parent, but if you're a parent and you put pe your children in the world, that feels kind of scary, right? But like, so think about God putting all, all of us in this crazy world. Like he has to trust us in a way. And I hope that we can, 
connect with that and trust ourselves more uh, because we do have the ability to cope and be resilient and make hard decisions and um, forgive ourselves and move forward. Um, so I hope this is helpful. If it's not, that's okay. Find your own journey. But these are the things that have been helpful for me in building confidence. Um, I know we have about five minutes left. Do you have any questions? Yes. How do you address the people, like you were referring to, young know, people asking you personal questions about you know, when you're going to have kids and things like that? Right. How do you address things like that? Because, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a convert of seven years, mm -hmm. so this whole culture is new. <laughs> And Welcome. <laughs> and, and my big thing is, I, I'm over 30 and I'm single, and oh, that's like right. such a disease, you know? Yeah. And I, it doesn't bother me. Mm -hmm. Why does it bother everyone else? Right. So how do I, you know, how do I blow people off? How do I tell them, thanks for your concern, but yeah. out? So for me, it depends on the day, and it depends on if I'm in a good mood or not. <laughs> but often, like, now and I would never have done that in the, like five years ago but now I'm more confident saying like kind of putting it back on them like why like why do you even wonder like I don't walk around wondering why people don't have children or are single like I think about a million other things that are more interesting than that right like so I don't so I'll put it back on them a lot or sometimes I won't answer like um, I'll just say Either I, like this is one way to make people feel uncomfortable is to like <laughs> not say anything. And like therapists, we get really comfortable with silence. So, like, it's, but like I'll just say I'll just like do this or walk away. <laughs> like I've done that before. But I, I'll just often put it back on them. Like why do you care? Like like what's the problem? Yeah. Like you're not like. Do you want to date me? Why do you care? <laughs> <laughs> you know. So. Any other questions? Cool. Thank you, everyone. This was great.